A few weeks back, I needed to brew a big, juicy, hazy IPA, but get it turned around really quickly as well. Luckily for me, the good people at the Malt Miller had just sent me some of this new Mango Madness yeast from WHC Labs. So did it deliver on its promise of big tropical fruit flavors and quick turnaround time? Let's find out. Before we get into it, if you're enjoying the content here, do please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, drop a comment in below, and you can also support me by following the affiliate links in the description or even hitting the thanks button down there. So what is this new exotically named yeast from WHC Labs? Now it's been branded as thermotolerant yeast, but a quick look at the specs gives you a pretty clear indication that it is in fact derived from a quike strain, pretty much just based on the temperature range alone. Now I don't know why WHC are avoiding using the word quike in their branding for some of the new yeast, but I do have it on good authority that this one is in fact an isolate from the Ebergarden strain. It is important to remember that the original quike cultures are made up usually of a range of different yeast strains and sometimes even bacterias as well, which have found a kind of natural balance over time and lots of generations of reuse. When we get quike isolates like Mango Madness, these are single strains that have been selected because they are the most dominant or perhaps the ones with the most desirable uh, characteristics out of that culture and then they are isolated, hence isolate, and that is what we get given as the commercial product from labs. As such, we may see quite a bit of variation in these kinds of yeasts, even if they have technically been isolated from the same original source. For this particular product, as you can probably guess from the name, WHC are claiming the production of high levels of mango and also guava esters and flavors, as well as a really high uh, optimal temperature range of 31 to 37 degrees, high flocculation and high attenuation and a massive ABV tolerance of up to 17%. With the ability to operate in such a high temperature range comes a much shortened fermentation time and also conditioning time. And in a commercial setting at least, that also gives the opportunity potentially to make quite a bit of savings uh, related to those factors. This all sounds great obviously, but to be honest, as somebody who's never been the biggest fan of Quike, uh, I was a little bit skeptical. Whilst I've always recognized the utility of these yeasts in terms of the quick turnaround time and the ability to operate at really high temperatures, for me, I always felt like there was a little bit of a compromise in terms of flavor. And I didn't personally think that they were necessarily delivering the best outcome in terms of flavor for, for the beers that I use them in. I always felt like the flavor was being compromised to an extent in favor of getting quick beer, essentially. So let's look at the beer that I brewed to test out this particular strain and see if Mango Madness can give me a new perspective on thermotolerant yeasts. The recipe for this hazy IPA was loosely based on the focal spectrum recipe that you might remember from a previous video that I'll link above was used to test out the advanced hop products from Bath Haas. You can see the full brew file, the recipe link in the description, but to summarize, here are the kind of target numbers and a summary of the grain bill and hop schedule on the screen for you now. In this beer, I decided to use some Sabro alongside the Mosaic and Citra in the dry hop, and also took the opportunity to use a small sample of Yakima Chief's new liquid product, YCH702, in the Whirlpool. As far as I can tell, this is essentially their equivalent to Incognito from Bath Haas. The beer was fermented at 34 degrees C and within two to three hours, the beer hadn't just started fermenting, it was actually progressing very vigorously, as you can see. And within two days, it did look like it was pretty much done. I left it for a little bit longer than that because 
there was a lot of yeast and stuff still in suspension from the very vigorous kind of fermentation. Uh, and it did look like there was a little bit of CO2 still being emitted from it. But by day four, I checked that the gravity had stabilized and then began cooling it down ready for the dry hop. At this point, I was surprised to see that the final gravity had stopped at 10.30. Although there's a significant amount of maltodextrin in the grist, and I did use a very high mash temperature as well, I was still expecting to see a fairly good level of attenuation based on my previous experience with quite strains. It would seem based on my experience at least that this particular strain not only maybe isn't quite as attenuative to begin with but is also quite responsive to the mash temperature as well whereas strains like Voss for example in my experience even if you do mash quite high will tend to chew through most of the kind of complex sugars anyway and still deliver a fairly high level of attenuation and a fairly low final gravity. So I was a bit concerned with that final gravity, but the samples I was taking at that point still tasted great and they weren't overly sweet. So I proceeded with the dry hop following my usual method for that, chilling the beer down to 14 degrees and dry hopping for about two days, including the cold crash. The beer was in the keg a few days later and almost immediately it was quite drinkable. There was no obvious kind of green flavor to the beer and there wasn't any of that kind of hot bite that you quite often get with very young hazy beers or New England IPAs with a big dry hop. So from what I've seen of other people using this yeast and my own experience with this beer, it is definitely possible to get a beer from grain to glass within a week, uh, if not a matter of days. Certainly if you push the limits of the temperature range, and particularly if you were starting off with a wort that maybe had a slightly lower uh, starting gravity to what I was doing here, it can definitely be done in a few days for sure. But does it also deliver on the flavor and aroma? Well, here it is in the glass, and I am happy to say that it absolutely does deliver on flavor and aroma. This beer was tasting fantastic, even when I was sampling it at 30 plus degrees, pre-dry hop checking the gravity and it's just got better since. As of now I'd say it's right up there with some of the best kind of hazy IPAs that I've produced. As you can see the colour on it is beautiful, it's got that lovely golden yellow kind of hue to it. It's held a consistent but not overly kind of murky or soupy haze and there's good head retention as well. It's got a nice thick kind of creamy white head on the top there, uh, great lacing as well. So yeah, visually it looks the business and aroma wise, there's definite dank kind of citra and mosaic aromatics in there. There is some mango kind of notes to it. You get a little bit of the slightly kind of woody coconutty kind of sabro. So you do pick up a little bit of that neo mexicanus kind of character in the background as well. But yeah, it just smells like a, a big, juicy New England IPA. The aroma is quite punchy on this. And uh, yeah, difficult to say how much, obviously, the, the yeast esters um, contribute to that over the hops, but it's certainly not getting in the way of it. It's definitely supporting it to produce this kind of tropical and juicy aromatic that I'm getting out of the glass. It smells amazing, to be honest, and it's very much inviting a taste. So on that note, so the beer has a really good kind of thick body to it, um, really nice mouthfeel as well, but it's not overly sweet or cloying despite that really quite high finishing gravity. In fact, I think it does help uh, quite a lot to kind of balance out the fairly intense hop flavors that are in this beer. It does have some noticeable bitterness to it, but it's not astringent or harsh in any way and some Ebergarden derived strains have been noted as promoting quite high hop bitterness. So it was good to see that that wasn't the case with this beer. Uh, if anything, it's you know maybe kind of softening the, the bitterness for me. So yeah, again, helps with the drinkability because there is a little bit of bitterness to uh, level off the, the sweetness that's there, but not so much that it becomes unpleasant. It's absolutely packed with soft, fruity, juicy kind of flavors. And again, it's difficult to say sort of how much of that comes directly from the yeast, but it's certainly working in conjunction with the hops to produce that kind of classic New England 
kind of flavor profile in this beer and it's doing it really well. There is a lot of kind of sweet citrus flavor in there as well as some soft kind of stone fruit and peachy notes. And I'd have to say, yes, there's quite a bit of mango character in there as well. Uh, I would expect that anyway with, you know, Mosaic always expresses, particularly when it's with Citra, to me, uh, quite a lot of kind of mango-like flavor. But again, with this yeast, it's, it's certainly coming out uh, with that and um, it tastes great. Now, I have found when using other quite strains for beers like this, I've tested a few out like Voss and Hornet Island or, you know, isolates of those uh, particular strains that sometimes the hop kind of character might be a little bit muted or perhaps the, the bitterness might become a little bit astringent or, or harsh in some cases. I've also found one thing that I get with quite a few quark yeasts is there's a, a little bit of a hint of a kind of woody or maybe earthy ester uh, flavor that's in the background that I don't particularly enjoy. None of those issues are, are present with this. I wouldn't if I was drinking this beer in isolation, guess that it was brewed uh, with a quark strain. Um, I'm not picking up on any of those characteristics that I might have recognized in the past. I would say that I would certainly consider this as a potential alternative to my kind of favorite yeast strains for this kind of beer, like London Ale Free uh, or Verdant. So it's a definite stamp of approval from me for Mango Madness and how it's gone in this beer. But I'm very pleased to say you don't just have to take my word for it. This beer has just won a local competition to be rebrewed at Brewpoint Brewery in Bedford for their Beer and Beyond Festival on the 4th and 5th of May. I've actually just done that brew this weekend uh, over at Brewpoint. So you'll be able to see a little bit of a sneak peek of some of the footage that will form a follow-up video to this, uh, obviously about remaking that beer and uh, the festival itself, hopefully. So stay tuned for that. But yeah, I'd like to think that there's a little bit of validation there for this beer being selected by professional brewers uh, out of a range of really very high quality entries that went into the competition uh, as the one that they would like to rebrew for their festival. So as a proof of concept for this particular product, I don't think I can do much better than that for you. And obviously, if you get the opportunity to come down to the festival on the 4th and the 5th of May at Brewpoint in Bedford, you will have a chance to try a beer brewed with Mango Madness for yourself and see if you agree with my thoughts on this one. So hopefully, I might even see some of you there. Cheers, everyone. I'm the dude. So that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that or uh, his dudeness or uh, duder or...